Thank you so much um, for uh, you know, ASAE um, members and guests uh, for uh, joining us and expressing your interest in taking this DEI journey with us. Um, we are excited to share our experience with you. Um, my name is Aaron Coates. I'm the marketing specialist at Emergency Nurses Association. I'm Altair Delau. I'm the senior associate in emergency nursing research. And I'm Rashonda Legault, senior manager of learning experiences. Um, so in our discussion, uh, we hope that you can take at least one useful nugget of information uh, to take back and implement in your organization to start the process of creating positive change in your organization. So what will we be talking about? Um, who is ENA? Who we are as an association? The context, so the impetus for performing this work at our, our organization. Um, the three pillar DEI model, uh, the format that we developed to implement these initiatives. Um, one year later, so where are we now and how things have evolved as our uh, efforts starting to have started to take shape. Uh, challenges and opportunities, uh, plus lessons learned. And then your application of the three pillar DEI model um, in real world actions that you can take to your, to your organization to create change. And then we're gonna have a Q&A um, to hopefully have a, a great discussion to, you know, to see where you guys are um, just culturally and, you know, just where you are on your journey. So who is ENA? Um, the Emergency Nurses Association, our mission is to advance excellence in emergency nursing. Our vision is to be the premier organization for the emergency nursing community worldwide. And as an organization, we focus on well, as an organization that just celebrated our 50th anniversary last year, we focus on strengthening knowledge through education, networking, and advocacy of our 53,000 plus global membership. Um, we're headquartered in Schaumburg and we have a staff of approximately 100 folks. So what's the context of this? Um, many of you are aware, I imagine that George Floyd's film brutality sparked nationwide protest. Um, um, preceding events, um, of course, I was just that 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 event seemed to be kind of a jumping off point for a lot of um, movement in a cultural way um, in the workplace, um, and so we're seeing a lot of that um, kind of escalating now. Um, but there have been, you know, it's not new news, obviously. So preceding events include the deaths of Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Breonna Taylor, and many others, along with the lack of justice uh, toward uh, people like Dylan Roof, George Zimmerman, and many others. Um, all of these incidents have con contributed to the rising tension um, regarding social justice. Um, and then we're also going to, you know, kind of contextualize the, the passion of how this outside um, how this is affecting us from the outside in and has seeped into the workplace. Um, racial injustice, racial discrimination is not new, as I mentioned. Um, it's evidence with the current discussions around critical race theory and what is considered quote unquote appropriate to teach in classrooms. Um, we're talking about um, popular cultural events and incidents that intersect with workplace. For example, uh, at ENA, we have a large community of Filipino emergency nurses who are dealing with the uptick in uh, anti-Asian hate crime. And they have to come to work with that on their shoulders as well. So how are we addressing those folks? How are they getting some support in their workplace? Also recognition that staff members are impacted by current events. So living through some of these incidents uh, can be traumatizing, but we still have to come to work. Uh, what do we do with those emotions and how does it affect the way that we interact with our coworkers? and colleagues, specifically if, you know, it has to do with race and we're dealing with coworkers of the particular race that is, you know, um, in question or being, you know, considered the, uh, what is often used in conversations as the oppressor. Um, some organizations have been increasingly vocal in their support of justice. Um, we've seen more explicit inclusion of more diverse actors in commercials. We've seen company statements in support of, you know, allyship um, when certain incidents happen but also, you know, to, to their, you know, regarding accountability, where are they now a year and a half later? Um, and then staff conversation circles, uh, or what we've, what we've called conversation circles, um, opens the door for DEI conversation and action uh, among staff members. So what are some of the opportunity areas? Um, we strive to ensure that organizational values are represented in all facets of the workplace, reflecting the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
there's a business case for diversity in the workplace, financial and cultural, um, that strengthens the organization's value to peers, members, staff, and uh, all of which are trending um, toward quote unquote belonging as being the number one driver of uh, satisfaction, particularly when it comes to employees and hiring. Um, with that, I'll kick it over to my colleague, Wishanda, um, for the next part of the discussion. Thanks so much. So as Aaron mentioned, we're definitely very fortunate to have great staff engagement in the conversation circles that we hosted, but we really wanted to capitalize off this energy and knew that we could, that more could be done, but that we didn't have a pre-existing DEI strategy. So it was after one of these conversation circles that I was having an informal conversation with both our CEO and our chief governance officer. And I mentioned, you know, I had a few thoughts and ideas around DEI engagement and growth. Um, and specifically, this conversation was related to a board memo and a final recommendation that a DEI work team that had previously convened had prepared, again, in presentation for the board. Um, and I was told, and this is a direct quote, I went back and looked at my email, um, we welcome your thoughts and additional recommendations to help inform the board discussion and guide actionable outcomes for the remainder of 2020 and beyond. So for those of you in leadership roles out there, this type of conversation and green light to brainstorm was absolutely critical in, in, the, in this moment. And it really was also you know, very critical in the development of our DEI journey. In many ways, it validated that more needed to be done and that we as staff have ideas that are worth hearing and that the executive team was willing to invest and leverage staff innovation. Um, so given this blank slate, you know, I took some time to brainstorm, you know, really what is our ideal state as an organization? I also researched what others have done, both successfully and not successfully, and how could that be applied to our specific culture and our specific membership? And uh, truth be told, the first iteration of this DEI framework was very much a, a Word document with a bulleted list of DEI-centered initiatives, projects, and engagement ideas around what could it look like at ENA. And the purpose of this was really to get a general sense of what could, again, could be our potential impact as an organization. So I took these notes, again, this Word document with some bullet points to my boss, who's the chief learning officer. And together, we, we created the first draft of the pillar framework. And the purpose of this design was really to guide our DEI, DEI efforts centered around these three areas of impact or core pillars that fall within ENA's organizational mission and scope of work. This framework also served as a foundational resource to assist the DEI committee and subsequent supporting groups in framing each of the core team's charges and action plans. So it was from this framework, from this framework, I collaborated with a few other key individuals to create our DEI program charter. So this program guide is really what holds ENA accountable to provide consistent and intentional and impactful engagement within these pillars to foster the change and the growth throughout ENA, its members, its staff, as well as the communities we serve. Um, and we have added this as a PDF handout for you all to access, and we truly hope that it supports you in your journey. So this charter was then submitted to our senior leadership team for feedback and then was presented at the following board of directors meeting. So we had feedback collected, we had buy-in secured, and then this vision was presented at an all staff meeting where we were able to inform staff that they too would have a role in the evolution and execution of this framework. So I've mentioned a few times now, I think, our, our, that we have our three pillar DEI model. So I wanted to take the next few slides to go over it a bit deeper and really elaborate a bit more on this framework. So our three pillars are the association, membership, and leadership. And each of these impact areas or pillars has a goal attached to it. For example, the association pillar's goal is that ENA will serve as an association and an emergency care leader in the diversity, equity, and inclusion landscape. Our membership pillar's goal is that ENA will develop a portfolio of resources to ensure that emergency nurses have access to education that will strengthen their awareness and knowledge of DEI with an emphasis on improving clinical decision-making as well as patient care experience. Our leadership, the goal of our leadership pillar is that ENA will take a proactive role in increasing the diversity of the emergency nursing profession. Um, the image to the right of this slide, we believe is a great visual representation of how we framed our efforts. Um, and one thing to, to note quickly is that this very much is, is an evolving 
experience. And it was kind of interesting as we were putting together the slides for this presentation, we were looking back at our original documentation for the pillar framework. And we're like, wow, you know, things really have changed since then, right? And we are better able now to align our pillar framework with the initiatives that we have started to implement. So it's been a very cool experience. And it's just, you know, this presentation in itself was a great opportunity for us, I think, to kind of hit pause and kind of think about like, you know, where are we going and is it still aligned and, and how do we bring our, our document along with us on the journey? So now I'm gonna focus on each individual pillar and hopefully you can make some connections to, to your organization through, through the work that we've created. So the association pillar, the work is really focused around exposing ENA staff, both consistently and intentionally to impact engagement to further DEI in the workplace. Um, we are working as an organization to strive and, and to do our best to become thought leaders and a, and a model association through our DEF, DEI efforts, as well as to strengthen ENA's external presence on DEA engagement. Um, from an internal perspective, what this really means is, you know, we're, we're looking to demonstrate a long-term commitment to staff training and education around DEI topics. And it's worth noting that, you know, this education is not all coming from, you know, consultants or experts in the field. Many of us are trying to learn through each other's experiences. Um, you know, we all bring a set of life perspectives to the conversation. We all have our own external resources and really learning together and through the experiences of, of the entire team. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, we really do, you know, and I hope this presentation is the start of, of ENA becoming a thought leader in DEI conversations. Um, both within the association as well as the emergency care industry. And one other component of this pillar is advocacy. Um, and, you know, really identifying relevant legislate, excuse me, legislation that warrants ENA support and how can we partner with external stakeholders to contribute to the conversation and rather development of, of legislation. So of this, of this pillar, we have formed a staff council and we are so proud and super humbled to say that there are so many different departments represented in, in this staff council. Um, we've got the listing in the slide. So the staff council meets every third week. Um, what I have found the most beneficial and kind of eye-opening piece of this meeting is we have, we start off every meeting with, and we open every meeting with new learnings. So that's just our opportunity as individuals to say, you know what, I watched this amazing documentary and, you know, I recommend it for these reasons. Or, you know, I just came across this blog posting and I just want to dialogue and I want to vent and, and I want to better understand. And it just, it's, it's how we kick it off. And I think it really just sets like such a, I don't want to say positive tone, but it, I don't know, it just helps us always learn. I think that's the only way I can, I can say that. Um, and through this staff council, we developed, you know, we've developed um, an evolving list of initiatives that will, you know, support this pillar's work. And then we divided um, the work up into small groups. So as we have projects, you know, whoever has identified, you know, a project can take the lead on that project. It doesn't, you know, automatically go to the leadership of that council. Really, people have the opportunity to own their own work and to develop smaller subgroups around work that they're doing. So our membership pillar. So the, the charges that we really identified for, for this pillar are to, are to expand ENA's cultural competency and curriculum offerings, um, to ensure that DEI topics are embedded within ENA's educational portfolio. Um, you know, we are tasking ourselves to make sure that ER nurses are competent clinical decision makers, that ER nurses develop the cultural competencies needed to work with diverse patient populations, and that the emergency department leadership is empowered with resources needed to value and support a welcoming environment, thank you Association Forum for those words, for staff and patients. And from this, we formalized a DEI member committee. As I mentioned earlier, we did have a work group um, previously, but we had to formalize the structure and really give the opportunity to recruit volunteers to participate in this formalized DEI member committee. Um, and some of the work that, you know, they're being charged with is to develop recommend, 
recommended definitions of diversity and inclusivity for ENA, to assess and identify the needs of current and future ENA members to promote DEI, to determine barriers to diversity and inclusivity within the emergency nursing profession and ENA community, as well as advise on the opportunities for expanding engagement with members from diverse backgrounds and creating, again, a welcoming environment that encourages diversity of thought. Um, and some of the projects you can see are, are listed on this slide. They have already began the process of conducting a baseline DEI research study for all membership. Um, our upcoming annual meeting is going to be hosted in September and the committee has taken on the challenge of three separate presentations. And they have also taken on the, the developing a, a list of pipeline suggestions. So our final pillar is the leadership pillar. And truth be told, this is definitely one of the more difficult pillars to implement because of its long-term nature, as well as the, the importance and the emphasis on external relationship building that's needed. Um, but I will note that this pillar very much needs and works with the other pillar leadership in order to get its work done. So again, there's collaboration across the board on this. So what is this pillar focused on? Um, diversifying access to the profession and leadership roles within ENA. And how are we doing that? We're focusing on partnerships and outreach. We're in the process of developing partnerships with academia and schools of nursing to bring awareness of the emergency nursing profession to historically underrepresented communities. We are, again, in the process of developing relationships with relevant organizations to promote outreach in historically underrepresented communities, as well as, and, and I would say most importantly, working with our state and chapter leaders to develop and disseminate materials that promote emergency nursing careers. Um, and we think that, you know, in discussing this presentation that, you know, this is something that every, you know, every association, at least that I've worked for, you know, has that, that chapter and state leader engagement and really utilizing them to expand our efforts. Um, so that's primarily the focus of our leadership pillar. Now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Altair, who's going to talk about who's getting the work done. Thanks, Rashonda. So um, really, this, this is a brief synopsis of what our organizational chart looks like. And you can see we're kind of, our executive leadership is kind of centered around five um, streams of engagement. And so um, from there, we have people on the staff council, our core team, um, what I'm terming as collaborators, because kind of those people who are not on the staff council, but they're the people that we seek out um, to help us implement things. So maybe we need IT to put something up on the web or so forth. So who can have a role? Everyone can have a role. And so actually but taking a look at our full org chart and putting this together was a nice exercise to do because it identified a gap. And that gap is that in our government relations area, that's an area where we, we don't see um, current involvement, but that's not to say it can't grow. And that's kind of one of those more long-term developing pieces that Rashonda was talking about. So one year later, where are we now? So this is the fun part to see everything that's come to fruition. Um, first off, we've developed quarterly lunch and learns. Um, Again, our, our our team at ENA has about 100 individuals um, of you know whom 30 people or so are engaged in some way actively with either the core team, the staff council, or as those collaborators. Um, and I just want to emphasize that all the work that we've done has been in addition to our regular job functions, and you know maybe at times outside of our comfort zones, but in a really good and supportive way. And I think it's it's created growth amongst staff. Um, the Lunch and Learns have been a success and that it's, it's enabled us to offer opportunities for all staff to engage in, in dialogue that provides them a, an opportunity to walk away with an enhanced perspective on a particular topic. So we offer these quarterly, we offer each session twice. Um, the content runs 30 to 45 minutes with the bulk of it being that we're having a, a discussion amongst everyone who's there. It's, it's kind of a free for all, whoever wants to come comes. If you can't stay the whole time, that's fine, but we, we really just putting it out there. So here's a couple examples of, of what we've done. We've looked at diversity in children's literature, um, challenging conversations at work, exploration of Jewish culture, and adding pronouns to email signatures. So tailing off of the pronouns piece, you can see here there's an example of Rashonda's email signature where she now has her pronouns there, as well as at the very bottom, a link out to another organization with the question, why pronouns? 
this is a great example of how we um, implemented a process of, to create broad change to the organization. And I'll briefly walk you through that. So as many of you are aware, the use of pronouns both in email and face-to-face -face introductions is becoming more commonplace, rightfully so. I read more on this issue and decided to bring this to the staff council meeting as an opportunity for ENA. The staff council liked it. And from there, a few of us worked on a proposal that we eventually presented to senior leadership with guidance from our executive champion. Once that was approved, a few of us did the next um, leg of work to develop what the policy looked like, how would people opt in or opt out? What were kind of the, the rules of engagement for utilizing this option? As well as developing the, the lunch and learn presentation where we um, articulated the importance of the topic, how it aligned with ENA's core values and instructions for how to opt in. Finally, we followed that up with a subsequent post in our newsletter that summarized the same key points, importance, alignment, and process. In total, around 10 staff were involved to varying degrees. Again, from executive champ, core, core team, our staff council and collaborators. So also briefly, I wanna highlight the image that's on the right-hand side or the left-hand side um, to show how staff council has showcased their talents. Um, in this instance, our creative design team would graciously design a branded DEI look for our content, which we have been splashing everywhere we can. As mentioned on the last slide, um, ENA has a bi-weekly um, newsletter for employees called Team Talk with features, updates from our CEO, kudos to staff, good news sharing, IT tips, et cetera. We've now um, added a DEI new corner. This section is open to all staff to share out DEI resources that others may find useful in their work or just thoughtful pieces that encourage personal growth. Um, recently, our organization, like many, began the process of bringing staff back to the office after a virtual year. We were able to share out a timely article on how to keep the DEI conversation going as offices began opening back up. You can see by the insert, these are short pieces. We aim to, for a few key takeaways and a link out to two, um, one or two additional reading points. I feel pieces are especially impactful when the writer can make the connection as to why they found the content important enough to share out to all staff. This is one area where it has been great to see staff who might not normally be writers in their day-to-day -day work at ENA stretch a bit and take this on. Similarly to our employee newsletter, we've been able to foster a new connection to increasing DEI visibility to our members by working with our public relations team. Our PR team, now looks to us to provide regular updates on DEI resources that we can share out to members. In this example from June, which focused on Pride Month, we shared several resources on LGBTQ AI plus population. These particular resources um, provided content that members could read both for personal growth and professional growth to potentially incorporate into their care of this patient population. Um, our organization has swiftly become adept users of Microsoft's Teams, as did many over the last year. The virtual environment pushed all of us to find new ways to engage with our colleagues. Early on, we established a DEI channel that is open to all staff to share out resources and thoughtfully engage with one another. Um, we're continually working with our publications team to identify opportunities to feature DEI work in our member magazine. Again, we have 50, 53,000 plus members globally, so this is a great avenue to not only highlight ENA's work, but also to seek out stories from members on DEI work they're doing in their practice. A book club has also grown organically over the past year. They've tackled both light and heavy reading assignments. Um, authors whose work have been included include Mickey Kendall, Jennifer Aberhart, Lee Ayrton, and others. This is a example of our DEI library, and I don't expect you to be able to read all that. We just want to be able to share out how rich it is. Um, our DEI library is a living document. Aaron and a few others on the staff council spearheaded the development. It's available to all staff to both browse and offer content. Extensive work has begun to not only categorize the content, you might not be able to see the tabs below, but some of the content has been categorized into, for example, coursework and training, vocabulary, workplace practices, et cetera. But the additional and quite necessary step of classifying the intensity of the content is an essential point here. We recognize that each of us come into the workplace to accomplish a common goal of supporting the mission 
and vision of the organization. And as we begin to weave DEI into ENA, we understand that all of us are at a different point in our DEI journey. We wanna meet staff where they are and invite them in. I like to think of the different resource option as an a la carte experience. Um, we'll be also sharing this out with, to all members in the future. So one year later, where are we headed? Well, I can only honestly say that this has been very exciting work. We are currently working our way through an extensive pipeline of potential endeavors that crosses through staff, members, and board leadership. This is just a sample of ideas on the screen that we're vetting. Much of our pipeline was thoughtfully drafted by our member committee. Uh, we're working on DEI-specific DEI member awards, as well as thoughtfully adding in DEI components to other established awards. With our annual conference just around the corner, we are actively engaged in brainstorming DEI events we can host. For our next iteration of DEI as we move forward, we're starting to think about budget. Again, a lot of the things we've done this whole year and things that we're thinking about on screen here, um, highlighted in purple, we've done for next to nothing. Um, but we need to think for the future, are there training opportunities we wanna to provide to staff, to members and so forth where a budget might be needed. Um, our foundation and research teams are actively developing a fellowship program and slash scholarship program that we hope to have approved very soon. Uh, we're presenting out our DEI work on a poster at conference. Again, really easy opportunity to continue to foster DEI awareness at no cost. And after this, after a whole year of work, it's probably time for a pulse check. You know, is, are we giving the right content to staff? Too much, too little? Is it accessible? What's missing? Is it the right format they wanna engage in? Um, we're planning to launch our member-facing DEI webpage to coincide with our annual conference. And I think one of the most rewarding things that I've seen is staff ownership. And I think Rashonda alluded to it already. We're doing all this work in addition to our regular workloads. It's been really great to see staff take on small chunks of work that help things keep things moving. For example, one person recently volunteered to keep a running log of our team talk content. So that'll be helpful in a year from now when we decide to, to look at, well, what did we run in February last year? Do we want to hit the same points? Do we want new points and so forth? So thanks a lot, Altair, um, for that. I, I think that that leads, um, you know, kind of perfectly into, you know, some of the challenges um, that come along with doing this work in the, in the workplace um, under these conditions. Um, and I say these conditions as in um, not having a dedicated staff person, um, where does that is, that is their role. Um, but I also don't want to leave it as challenges. I think uh, opportunities are also there um, to be had. So thinking about the blank page, um, the blank page, you know, is, is, you know, daunting for anyone, whether they're coming up with, you know, the way to culturally realign their workplace or write a short story or a poem, like it's, it's, it's daunting for anyone, or if you got finals, you know, whatever it is, um, that blank page can be a, a daunting thing to face, but it's also an opportunity for you to begin paving your own way. Um, you hear us refer to this DEI as a journey um, and people at different points along in their journey. And so understanding that your journey takes the, it can, it can move at the pace that you want um, at the speed that you want, at the level that you want. And so taking that um, into consideration, that blank page can maybe not be quite as scary when you understand that um, if you're in the right environment, um, the first word is just, is the first step to, to moving forward. So, um, and then thinking about, um, you know, being afraid of saying or doing something wrong. Again, it's all about comfort level. Stuff is new to people. Um, you know, we have coworkers whose, you know, children have come out as trans and they're dealing with that in their schools. And they've come to our, you know, DEI council meeting and expressed that, you know, kind of concern. And we've been able to provide resources or have shared conversations in being able to like do that. So it's a, it becomes, you know, a relationship building opportunity. Um, and it creates a space for us to learn and grow. And that's a great opportunity staff wide, membership wide, you know. Um, so I think that we have to make sure that we keep that in sight. Um, and then another challenge, um, educating from the bottom up. You know, it's, this is a grassroots effort. Like, as I said, you know, blank pages, um, lack of experience. Like, you know, I can't speak to, you know, uh, people who identify as women's challenges, but, you know, I'm in the conversation with people. So we're sharing that information across, you know, across um, different identities. And so being able to be comforted in that, and we 
build a library of resources that we're able to use and share with each other so that we are essentially educating each other on how to interact with each other. And we can take that outside, you know, into either our, you know, other workspaces, our collaborative workspaces like external and obviously into the world. Um, another challenge, which was brought up earlier, financial resources for moving forward. Um, we don't have a person whose role it is for them to, to do this. So there's not a budget line item for um, DEI work necessarily, but um, you know, when you have the kind of buy-in that we, that uh, Rashonda alluded to from our leadership, um, then when we see that there's progress to be made, when we see that there's progress that is made, then we can discuss the value of working with leadership, um, you know, for the next budget, you know, for the next, you know, uh, uh, you know, budget year and figuring out like where, where can we add line items? Where can we add um, access to resources so that we can build this out with their trainings or um, resources that are like, you know, maybe it's something that's um, uh, some sort of, uh, you know, book or pamphlet or whatever that's brought into the office for, you know, all staff to access that has a price point. Um, and then lastly, but not only um, staff and volunteer capacity. Again, we don't have a role. Uh, we don't have a person in that role. Um, and trying to figure out who's interested in, you know, playing a role, you know, not everyone is comfortable, not everyone is interested in, um, you know, kind of stepping out on, uh, stepping out into a realm that they're uncomfortable with or unfamiliar with. And so um, being able to, you know, uh, take that into consideration as Altera said, you know, meeting people where they are, but we can also ask, well, how, how, how willing are you to participate? You know, everyone can participate at their own level of comfort. If all it is, is you can just, you know, if at most you can send a link to, you know, something you saw on Instagram that you thought might be helpful and that goes in team talk or into the, um, the all staff teams channel, that's fine. You know, that's sharing, that's a resource. That's something, you know, maybe the person who created that meme ends up being, you know, someone who goes on to, to write for stuff that goes on TV for one particular Instagram uh, conversation I'm, uh, or one particular uh, Instagram meme I'm thinking about, um, where it grows and becomes a bigger thing, but it started off as something small. And so like, you know, understanding that um, the, the analogy I've used in the past is um, not everyone needs to be a politician, but you know, people can vote, people can donate, people can, you know, spend money in a particular district. Like all those things are making a decision and contributing in a way that is, um, you know, building a culture and building a environment that you want to be um, inclusive and diverse, obviously for, you know, all the reasons that we've talked about before, but I think um, mainly being able to see being able to see that change that you have and that impact that you have, even at a smaller, you know, even if your role is quote unquote smaller, um, thinking about, you know, words like power and clout, like those things don't have to matter as much when it comes to this kind of work. So I think that's important to, to keep in mind. All right. So um, I am going to talk about lessons learned, but I think that the title of this slide should actually be lessons learned because our journey is not over. We are very much still in the beginning, you know, a year and a half later. Um, but what have we learned thus far? Um, I will go through this um, pretty succinctly, but cross-team collaboration will maximize results. I cannot stress to you the value and the growth that we have had because we have had so many contributors. And, you know, we've already shown to you that our creative services directors had a role, right? That our marketing team has had a role that our research team, you know, we can go on and on and so many people have brought their perspectives and their energy to the conversation and that has evolved into projects and initiatives. Um, just beyond my, beyond my wildest dreams, to be honest, having an executive champion. This is your shout out, Mr. Sykes, Terrence Sykes. Um, so he is our senior leadership go-to man. He, you know, when each of us that represents a pillar, we meet together as that kind of DEI core team. And he is there, he is listening, and he's seeing how we can take this to the next level. And he's also our advocate, you know, advocating for a budget, advocating for, you know, anything that we're, we're asking for. Um, I would say in this space, embracing self-reflection and continuing continuous learning is absolutely critical. We ourselves are not experts. We are on the journey with everyone else. 
Um, I was corrected in a meeting the other day, I mentioned sexual orientation and was corrected that, you know, we should be using sexuality and given the justification for that. And I was, you know, that was an awesome moment. I was like, thank you. Like the DEI landscape is changing and evolving and we should be along with that space. Um, sharing your knowledge, right? This journey isn't about just us as individuals. Like we are trying to shape a much larger culture as best as we can. And we're so excited that we've got 55,000 members and staff, right? So how can we share out on our knowledge to, to, to as many folks as we can? Educate, educate, educate. I feel like that's very self-explanatory, but I think that's the best way that, that we can share and we can self-reflect is by educating ourselves. Um, and then really quickly, there is a lot to do and, you know, embracing the fact that this, that things happen and change happens in slow tidbits and that that is okay. And to really be accepting that, you know, look at how far we've come in a year and a half, although it's not where we want to be, right? But where we want to be is, again, a journey that will never end. Um, and that's my vision is that, you know, we are all in this together and it's, it's, it's a long journey, but we're just, you know, just being a part of it and just loving and being in that moment is, just been very amazing, so embracing that. And now I'm gonna hand it back over to Altair. Thanks, Rashonda. So now we want everyone to quickly grab a pen and paper. We're gonna give you a little um, homework to do briefly so that you walk away with some lessons learned and some actionable items you think will work in your association. So first, take a few seconds to think of three areas for possible improvement around DEI initiatives. What DEI resources are you currently providing to members or staff? Um, maybe you need to start creating a policy on DEI or updating one. Um, you know, is the one you have on file working for you? As Rashonda mentioned, we're a year in and we are already seeing that our original project charter needs to evolve to meet us where we're at today. Um, can you allow space for challenging conversations in the workplace? Can you get some support for that from your leadership? What are three initiatives you can implement right away or somewhat right away? So maybe you wanna think about, you know, start building a repository of resources, something that everyone can start contributing to today. Um, can you do an environmental scan to see where and how DEI is already being addressed in your association? Can you survey your membership to see what their exact needs are? Who are three people you can begin the DEI conversation with? So I'll suggest bring it up at lunch with colleagues, get a pulse check, find your allies to help you start this work. Can you bring it up during a department meeting? Your department is probably your closest team you work with. Start there, start small and figure out how to go wider. Can you reach out to a trusted member of the executive team for guidance on how to bridge the different levels of teams at your organization? And finally, we wanna leave you with three thoughts on how DEI improves the workplace. A diverse team increases employee engagement. Employees who are engaged are more likely to stay, which translates to increased retention for the association, a win-win. Incorporating DEI into your association is part of who you are, can, can lead to attracting more talent to the organization. Show members and potential members that yours is an association that values their diverse perspective and be a standout to strategic partners and other aligned businesses that as the association of choice. And finally, companies with more diversity in their teams have been shown to be more successfully financial. And I'd like to thoughtfully phrase that in that financial gain should not be the driver of incorporating DEI best practices, but rather the secondary positive outcome of recognizing and welcoming all to the table. That was so well said, Altair. Um, and we would also like to give a special thanks to just really some of the folks at our organization that have helped us along in this journey. Um, again, it's it's not been any one individual. This is very much a collective, a collective experience. So we'd like to shout out our CEO who has given us that the highest level of green light we can get. Um, our executive champion again, who kind of guides this core team and really is our advocate. Our chief learning officer, who was there from the first day when it was. A, a Word document with bullet points and really helping frame that, that um, DEI framework. Our staff council, um, we could not do it without every single person that is engaged in that staff council. So we thank them. 
And then we'd also really like to thank Nicole Williams. If she's watching or listening, um, we appreciated your leadership in helping us along in this DEI journey. And Nicole was with us from the absolute very beginning as well and just made so many long lasting contributions to our DEI space. Um, here are just a couple of resources, resources and references um, that we encourage you to explore. And with all that said, we really just want to say thank you all so much for taking the time to, to listen to our journey. And we do hope that you found something in it that you can take back to your workplace immediately and start to make your impact. So we are now ready for questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it.